It's our second exercise class in a row, second week in a row, and today we'll be cleaning up some of the exercises that we have left from earlier in the class. In particular, we have two exercises from lectures 9 and 10, and I wanted to quickly revisit one of the questions from problem set 2. But in terms of topics, this is gonna be all about transparency, which was lecture 9. Lecture 10 was about the value of liquidity, and the problem set 2 question is also on the value of liquidity. Just like normal, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat in the process, and I'll get to them as soon as I notice them. So let's start with um, the exercise from chapter 8 or lecture 9. And this problem is about the model of post-trade transparency. And here we need to show that what we are asked to show is that price discovery is better under transparency, which was not quite immediate in that model, and it will, will not be quite immediate today, but we will um, work hard and eventually show it. So we need to consider the model of post-trade transparency just like we did in class, and uh, we um, we will revisit this model now because I do not trust that you have done it before the class. Uh, we will revise this problem now, uh, this 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 model now, and we will measure the average price discovery as time averaged expected square deviation between the uh, realized prices and the true fundamental value of the asset. In particular we will be taking this average over time, this was a horrible highlight. We will be just averaging this over two periods in our two period model, so we will not care that much about the speed of the price discovery or maybe to some extent about speed because we are not just looking at the second period. So I, have, I do not really have good justification for why we want to look at this measure in particular, because there are many other, there, there are many other measures you can look at. Uh, I guess the idea is that this measure trades off the final price discovery with the speed of price discovery to some extent, so it looks at both the speed and, and the final value. So just in terms of notation, we will use uh, superscripts K to denote regime, either transparent or opaque. We will use subscripts 1 and 2 to denote time periods within the model. And we need to show that price discovery is more efficient in the transparent market, which we will do. And uh, we will limit our analysis to the case when there are enough informed traders. And the reason for doing so will be obvious soon. So let us see how this works. What the model actually was. Uh, this was a pretty much a gloucester milgram model with two periods. So we had one, uh, one, one, one asset, as usual with fundamental value V, which is either high or low with equal probability. So we'll be looking at symmetric model for simplicity. Uh, our m mean is denoted as mu, and for today I will introduce the new notation which is sigma, which is the standard deviation in this model of the asset value. This will just be the distance between mu, between the mean, and the actual realized value. This will simplify some expressions just a little bit. Uh, we have dealers who are competitive, they set quotes, they are risk neutral, just your regular Gloston Milgram dealers who set quotes to get zero profit. <coughs> we have two traders, one in every period, and this is, I guess, the no was the non-standard distribution, so to make things more illustrative, we assumed some particular distributions of how traders arrived. So we said that with probability pi, both traders are informed, so both traders know the state, 
And with probability 1 minus pi, both traders are liquidity traders. So both of them are uninformed about the true value of V and their order flow is uninformative. Furthermore, we assume that if both traders are liquidity traders, then it is necessarily the case that one of them is the buyer and one of them is the seller. So one of them wants to buy, one of them wants to sell. And the order in which these orders are submitted is random. So with probability 50%, uh, the first order is a sell, the first with probability 50%, the first order is a buy from the uninformed traders. So here we, we are violating a lot of independence. We uh, Trader arrivals are dependent across periods. So if you infer that the first trader was informed, it's likely the case that the second one was informed too, will be informed. Uh, and we know that if uninformed traders submitted a sell order, then the next will be a buy order. So here order flow gives a lot of information. Really too much to be a plausible model, but it it is illustrative. So if you impose uh, more realistic assumptions, like trader arrivals are more or less IID in every period, uh, then you will still get more or less the same assumptions. I guess you need to have some serial correlation in order flow. No, you don't. Sorry. No. It will be a thing that will arise endogenously. So yeah. Even if you assume IID trader arrivals, so if they were um, informed or uninformed with probability pi in every period, and conditional on being uninformed, they submitted truly random order, which is independent of anything else, you would still get the same idea. So this is not a bad model, it is an illustrative model, a stylized model. Okay? And we'll be looking at two modes in which these markets can operate. So one is a transparent market in which all dealers in the second period observe the first order Y1 and in the opaque market only the dealer who actually executed the first order will know what it was. So and um, just, just a note, all of these slides with the setup of the model are just taken directly from lecture. So it's exactly the same model uh, that we had there. The only difference, once again, is that I introduced this sigma. Okay. Uh, yeah, and in a transparent market, the pricing is more or less straightforward. Here in the second period, both dealers would be able to identify the informed trader. meaning they would be able to make their inferences from the correlation in the order flow. If they see that the same order is submitted in the second period, as it was in the first period, they realize that the trader is informed, or both traders were informed. And they'd be able to price, uh, to offer the respective price. And vice versa, if they realize that they get an opposite order from what they got in the first period, then they realize that both orders were uninformed and they are able to trade with the second trader at um, mu, at the mid price, the mid quote. In the first period, however, under transparency, we have a standard Gloston Milgram pricing. So both traders realize that with probability pi, the trader is informed, with probability 1 minus pi, the trader is uninformed and so they price respectively to get zero profit in that first period. Now let's look at the opaque market where things were actually quite um, involved. So we did assume for technical reasons that the informed dealer will set the price after observing the uninformed dealer's quote because otherwise the equilibrium might not be might not exist or will have to be in mixed strategies. So this is a simplifying assumption. And here obviously the informed dealer is the one who got to observe the period one trade and the uninformed dealer is the one who did not 
get to see the period one trade. So the inside in lecture, the insight that we had was that the uninformed dealer would be picked off if the uh, if the trader is informed. So if the uninformed dealer prices at um, at ex ante expected value, so basically prices like this, the standard Wilson Milgram way, then due to the order of moves, the unin the informed trader would be able to undercut these quotes on the relevant side of the market. So say if the first order was a buy, and then in the second order the uninformed dealer sets as quote like this and, and the bid quote in a similar way, then what happens is if the first period order was a buy, then the informed dealer can undercut the second period quote of the uninformed dealer on the sell side. So the informed dealer would be able to offer a better bid price because that would mean that the both orders came from the uninformed dealer, uh, uninformed traders. While the S quote of the informed dealer would be very high because he knows uh, that the S quote would come into play only if this was a second buy order in a row, which would mean that both traders are informed, which means that asset value is actually high. So in the end, the, un the uninformed dealer would get to trade only with the informed trader, which would mean that if the uninformed dealer prices like this, he would be at a loss he would trade at a loss, which cannot happen. Which means that the uninformed dealers need to quote the widest spread possible. So they quote the ask price at VH and they will quote the bid price at VL in the second period of, in the opaque market. Now dealer eyes can still undercut these quotes by a little bit if they see that it is profitable to do so if they realize that the order flow comes from the uninformed traders. But they do not need to undercut by much, right? They only need to undercut by epsilon. Meaning that the spread that the traders face will still be large. They will still effectively face prices VH uh, to buy the asset and VL to sell the asset. The difference is, if the traders are uninformed, they will get to trade with dealer I. If traders are informed, they will get to trade with dealer U. So that was the idea in the opaque market, that this information gives uh, the dealer some rents. Note also that here dealer U gets zero profit still, while dealer I uh, actually trades at a profit because he can only, he can pick off orders from un the uninformed traders and so he can <clears throat> and he can trade he can offer them very unappealing prices and so he can sell at price bh an asset which is actually worth mu which gives him significant profit these information rents this profit from information generates uh, ge generates a bit of a quote war in period one because all dealers or both dealers want to become informed they want to attract this order flow to enjoy rents in the second period to enjoy positive profit so they will offer very appealing prices in period one so if you compute the profit you get that i's profit in period two will be equal to this expression one minus pi so the probability of getting uninformed traders times uh, sigma. So this is actually exactly sigma. So sigma once again is the difference between V and mu. And sigma is exactly the profit per trade that the uh, 
informed uh, dealer gets, right? So this profit from the second period means that in the first period, both dealers would trade at a loss. So they are willing to accept average loss equal to exactly this amount in the first period because they know that they will um, then get this profit in the second period. They will compensate it with the second period profit. And this leads to... Ah, yeah, this leads to half spreads being reduced to this value. Again, if you do the calculations using the informed profits. And here is actually why we need, why we, why we will assume pi greater than one half for this problem. You see that if pi is smaller than one half, then this half spread is negative. So you'll have crossed quotes, meaning that your bid will be higher than the ask. And so this is a bit of an uncomfortable situation because it invites the questions of where are the arbitrageurs? Okay, so this was a refresher on the model that we actually considered. Now let's see whether uh, how does price discovery work in this model. We basically already know all the quotes of all the traders. We just need to plug them into uh, the expressions that we need to compute. So here, under transparency in period one, we have discovered that we have shown that uh, prices will be pretty much Gloucester Milgram pro prices. So the ask price will be my plus mu plus pi sigma. And the bid will be mu minus pi sigma. So let us plug these into the this expectation of um, into this residual variance expression. That's what I meant. So if we first let us uh, look at this huge expression, which is just the elaboration on how this expectation opens up. So to compute the expectation, we just need to sum up the values of these pi at minus v over, over all possible contingencies that we will have in this model. So what are the possible events? Let us, on the first layer, look at, nope, these one halves. So this will be vh versus vl, the first two big events. So if price is v, if value is vh, we will look at this top bracket in which we can have three different orders. So with probability pi, we will have an order from an informed trader. And when value is VH, the informed trader always wants to buy. Which means that PIT minus V will be equal to A1T minus VH. With probability 1 minus pi, we will have an uninformed trader who wants to buy with probability 1 half. Because the uninformed trader buys and sells with probability 50-50. Which means that our P1T minus V will be equal to the exact same thing. A1T minus VH. Finally, with the remaining probability 1 minus P1 minus pi times 1 half, we have an uninformed trader who is willing to sell to sell a high value asset, which means that P1T minus V will be equal to B1T, this will be the price of trade, minus still VH. So this is the case when value is high. We'll have the same when the value is low. With probability pi, we have an informed trader who wants to sell the asset for sure. With probability 1 minus pi, we have an uninformed trader who wants to sell the asset with probability one half and buy the asset with probability one half as well. So this will determine the transaction price, whether it's A1T or B1T, and uh, the V will always be equal to VL in this lower big bracket. So 
So just to make sure that all of these computations are correct, let us replicate them. So we have expectation P one T minus V squared equal to one half once again starting with VH. Let me write it just slightly differently. We know that the sell order comes from either an informed trader with probability pi or with or from an uninformed trader with probability one minus pi over two. And here we have a one t minus vh. So we can write minus vh here. And what is our ask price? It, it was my plus mu plus pi sigma. And we can square this. And then we know that with probability 1 minus pi over 2 we have an uninformed trader who is willing to sell the asset which is a high value asset so we have this now this was first half and now we'll have the same bracket for the case when uh, the value is low in that case with probability pi plus 1 minus pi over half we have a sell order so the price is mu minus pi sigma and the asset value is VL plus 1 minus pi over 2 mu plus pi sigma minus V L over 2. Okay. So now let's simplify these expressions a little bit. We have that mu minus V is equal to sigma, whether it's VH or VL, just from the symmetry of the model and the way we defined sigma. So what we will have is not this much. In this this first square translates into so we'll have sigma times pi minus 1 pi is smaller than 1 so we'll have 1 minus pi squared times sigma squared okay that's what our first square transformed into in the second square we have sigma sigma times minus pi minus 1 which means that after we ignore all the signs due to squares we'll have 1 plus pi squared times sigma squared and if you do the same calculations with the lower bracket you'll see that it's exactly the same amount as this upper bracket due to the symmetry of the model due to the fact that we assume that uh, uh, values high and low with equal probabilities and that the uninformed traders buy and sell with equal probabilities I mean that you'll have this one this same bracket once again so we'll just have two over two two one halves okay now another manipulation we can make is notice that this first bracket is equal to 1 plus pi over half over 2 I will think I will change it here so it will be 1 plus pi over 2 and now we can take some of the things out of the brackets in particular we'll have something left but we can take away a lot of things so we can take out 1 plus pi and 1 minus pi and sigma squared because they are present in both terms here and we also can take away one half so what will we have what will we have left we'll have 1 minus pi from the first term and plus 1 plus pi from the second term 
swiftly doing the math. This first bracket equals 2, which cancels out with these two. This 1 plus pi times 1 minus pi is an expression that you've seen in school. It can be written as 1 minus pi squared. And we have sigma squared left. Meaning that we have arrived exactly to the, to the expression that I promised you we will arrive to. This one. Okay, so this is one of the four terms that we needed to compute. So we need to compute this residual variance for prices in two periods under two scenarios. We've just done one of each. So let us move on. Let us move to the second period under transparency. <coughs> It'll be a little simpler. So as we've discussed, we know that this price will be actually equal to V in case traders are informed because they, they will be identified as such. And vice versa, price will be equal to the mid quote mu if traders are identified as uninformed, which will always happen if traders are uninformed. So what this means is that with probability pi, traders are informed, our residual variance is zero, meaning that the value, the fundamental value of the asset is actually perfectly learned by the dealers, by the market. And with probability 1 minus pi, our price will be exactly sigma away from uh, the true value. So the price will revert down to mu, both ask and bid. In this scenario, in the 1 minus pi scenario. Which means that, yeah, p minus v will be equal to sigma. So we have that this expectation is equal to 1 minus pi times sigma squared. And if we take the average of our two terms over time, so this one and the one that we just computed, this one, we'll have 1 half times 1 minus pi squared times sigma squared from the first period, and we have 1 half times 1 minus pi from the second period. And this just reduces to this expression. Again, let's very, very quickly check that. So, we'll have another expression. We want to find this time averaged sum of residual variances under transparency. So we know we have 1 minus pi squared sigma squared. Oh, you know what? Yeah, let's do it this way. 1 minus pi squared plus 1 minus pi times sigma squared over 2. I think that's right. Which means that we have Two minus pi minus pi squared. Wait, okay, I did I do I did something wrong. I did something wrong. I was trying to figure out how should I um, arrive to the expression that I had in the slides. The answer is I probably don't. Okay, so we'll just have this. We will just have this then. Oh no, okay, okay, I, I realize it now. So we can unravel this 1 minus pi squared back into this sum of 1 plus pi times 1 minus pi, which means that we'll have 1 minus pi times 1 plus pi plus 1. Yeah, that's the thing, that's the way.
which means that we will have 1 minus pi. If we just take this one half in here, we will have, uh, I don't mean this fraction, 1 plus pi over 2 times sigma squared. Yeah, that's the thing. And that is actually the expression that I had in the slice. Exactly this one. So we're going slowly here, we're just verifying all the calculations. Uh, just to make sure everything's correct. Okay. So we've computed our price, uh, residual price variance and which symbolizes the quality of price discovery for the case of transparency. Now let's move to opacity, which it will be just some more algebra. Now, as we argued, when we did refresh of the model, our half spreads under opaqueness in the first period will be equal to 2 pi minus 1 times v minus mu, which is sigma. Meaning that if we compute the expected price variance, it will be equal to this amount, which is actually non-trivial. Let us go back to our whiteboard, beige board. So I think these blocks of expressions mix a little bit. So let me put the lines that will separate them. Okay. So we are looking now for the expected price variance in the first period under opaqueness. And this is equal to well, pretty much the same amount that we had here. So we'll have 1 half times uh, pi plus 1 minus pi over 2, which is the case when we have high value of the asset and both traders want to buy. The difference is we will have, instead of pi here, we'll have 2 pi minus 1. With probability 1 minus pi over 2, we'll have high value of the asset and the trader is willing to sell because the trader is uninformed. Once again, we'll have the same thing, just mu minus 2 pi minus 1 instead of uh, mu minus pi times sigma. And once again, the second, the second bracket that we'll have will be equal to this one. So we can just limit ourselves to one of them. So now let's get to reducing this expression. Once again, we will re rewrite this first bracket as 1 plus pi over 2. The first square will be equal to 2 pi minus 1 times sigma minus yet another sigma. So you'll have 2 pi minus 2 times sigma, all of it squared, which means that all in all you have 4, 1 minus pi squared, sigma squared, plus the second term 1 minus pi over 2. What do we have here? We have minus 2 pi minus 1 sigma, minus yet another sigma, which means that you'll have just minus 2 pi sigma, all of it squared. So you have 4 pi squared, sigma squared. Okay, almost there, almost there. Now what can we take out? So we'll have 4 over 2 on both sides, so we'll just have 2. Sigma squared also remains in each side. We also have one 1 minus pi term on each side. So we can take that out as well. So what do we have left? From the first term we have left 1 plus pi times 1 minus pi, which is 1 minus pi squared. <coughs> From the second term, we only have this pi squared left. So you have plus pi squared. We see that these pi squares cancel out, which means that in the end, I got the equality sign here, 
In the end, we are left with this 1 minus pi times 2 sigma squared, and this will be the residual price variance in period 1 under opacity. opacity. Again, exactly what we have in the slides, which is an encouraging sign. In period 2, we know that price will always be equal to V, so S quote will be at VH, bit quote will be at VL. So no derivations here. Just going back here and doing this thing again. This will be slightly faster. So expectation of PO2 minus V squared will be equal to what? With probability pi plus 1 minus pi over 2. Once again, we'll either have a high V and a pi order, which means that P will be equal to exactly V, or we will have a low value and a sell order which means that price is equal to the bid equal to VL means that P minus V is exactly zero once again while with the remaining probability 1 minus pi over 2 we have a mismatch so we have uninformed trader trading incorrectly so high, either selling a high value asset or buying a low value asset which means that P minus V will be equal to 2 sigma so you'll have 4 sigma squared once you square that expression. Which means that once again we arrive to the same value, which is 2, 1 minus pi, sigma squared. This means that under opaqueness we get the same residual price variance in both periods, so there is no additional price discovery in the second period compared to the first period. So the average is at 2. Uh, average residual variance does not change over time. Okay, we've computed all of the four residual price variances that we need. We've even computed the averages under opaqueness and under transparency. Now the only thing we have left is to compare them. So if you plug in all the expressions that we had, this is the residual price variance that we just obtained under opaqueness. We have already established that under transparency the residual price variance is equal to this expression. And if we cancel out sigmas on both sides, we cancel out 1 minus pi's on both sides, we are left with 1 plus pi over 2 versus 2. And we know that pi is between 1 half and 1, which means that the left hand side is at most 1 and a half, which is definitely smaller than 2. Which means that the residual price variance under transparency is lower than under opaqueness, which means that price, tran price discovery under transparency is better than under opaqueness. So on the very surface level this is a very intuitive result. You would think that transparency yields better price discovery, but as you saw the computations actually are not 100% trivial, so they require dabbling in quite some algebra. So this concludes our exploration of this exercise. Now if um, no, the remaining two problems will be shorter than this one, so this one was a bit long due to all the cal calculations, but I think the other two might take us about the same amount of time, which means that we might be able to finish on time, if not early, for once. And this also means that this is probably the good time for a break which is a bit early, but nonetheless. 
So if you have any questions on this problem that we just considered, uh, feel free to ask them during the break and I will answer them once we come back.